So thank you so much to Megan for joining us. It's a really uh, great privilege to have you here. Uh, and thank you to many of you <coughs> who've uh, um, signed up to the event and uh, actually donated as well, which has really helped make it possible for us to have Megan here with us tonight. Uh, so just a bit of Zoom keeping, if, if possible, it would be really great if you can stay on mute for the duration of the talk. And then towards the end of the talk, we'll have a um, little Q&A session so you can come off uh, mute if you need to. But equally, the best thing to do is to use the chat button, which is on the bottom of your screen. There's a little chat button. If you press that, you can type in a question and use that to ask uh, any question that you want uh, to Megan. And we'll try and cover some of those towards the end of the session. We should be uh, taking about an hour, just over an hour for, for the evening. So we'll hear from Megan for probably about 45 minutes or so and then have a bit of time for discussion at the end. So please do feel able to ask questions if there's anything you want to ask Megan as we go along. So I'm sure you're all here because you already know Megan very well. She's one of our um, leading naturalists in the UK and uh, obviously a really familiar face to us now on Spring Watch, Autumn Watch and recently Winter Watch. We were just chatting beforehand how brilliant Winter Watch th was this time considering how difficult it is to uh, um, work across the country uh, in the current situation with COVID-19 and the lockdown. Um, so, so we know Megan as a fantastic zoologist, she's a campaigner, a photographer and has co-written her first book just recently uh, but I also think of Megan as, as having a, a particular techie interest I noticed that quite often she's the one that's coming out with um, some of the latest gadgets and science and ways of talking about nature and capturing nature which is really really interesting sort of bringing us all into the modern world of how we can connect to nature She's travelled extensively and uh, like us, I, I'm sure uh, we all recognise the ecological emergency and the crisis in biodiversity that goes on around us. And I think Megan, Megan's approach on programmes like Winterwatch makes us all really hopeful for the actions we can all take and the changes that can be made. And we've all been out noticing nature so much more during the pandemic. Uh, many of us have been appreciating so much more the wildlife on our doorsteps and we've certainly seen that in Sheffield and Rotherham with so many people out on our nature reserves really enjoying our fantastic places like Blackamoor and Wyming Brook and Greno Woods and Kilnhurst Dings and so please you know do, do if you're not already a member please do join the trust and and find out more about some of our nature's nature reserves and the brilliant places on your doorstep. And as well as, as that, uh, during the uh, lockdown, we've been um, working through virtual forums, like, like things like these sorts of events. We've got Nature Natters and Nature Adventures, which have been uh, giving lots of ideas for how you can connect with nature. So do take a look at our social media and our website pages, if you can access those, uh, to find out more about how you can learn and connect with nature, which is really helping us at this time. So it's really great to welcome you all and particularly, of course, to welcome Megan. We've been really looking forward to this, really excited to have her here. And so on that note, Megan, I will pass to you. Hello. Good evening, everyone. Um, just wanted to say hi. Thank you all very much for spending your evening with me. I really appreciate it. Um, I, I would try and estimate what day it is, but quite frankly, it's lockdown three. It could be Monday, it could be Friday. I think it's Thursday, but um, we'll, we'll go with that. Happy Thursday, <laughs> you're all having a lovely time. And um, thank you very much, Liz, for that really wonderful and very kind introduction there. Um, very much greatly appreciated. Um, if you don't know me, my name is Megan, and as Liz said, I've been doing uh, a lot of the watches this year, which was came as a bit of a surprise to me, if I'm honest. Um, it's never something that I expected to be given the opportunity to do, but I've loved every single second of being able to communicate the latest science and the latest wildlife stories with everyone watching. So it's been a whirlwind of a year, that's to, not to say the least. I mean, we started off in March last year when we went into the first lockdown. Um, I ended up moving in with Chris Packham, who's my stepdad. Um, and I remember in the spring, it was really early in the morning and I looked outside 
Um, and there was Chris on his hands and knees in the middle of the woodland. And I kind of, this is quite a normal behaviour, you know, he, do, he does this kind of thing all the time. And I didn't really think too much of it. And I went downstairs later on and um, I said, what, what were you doing on your hands and knees down under the trees? And he said, well, the first celadines had arrived. And that's, of course, such a beautiful sign of spring. Um, so he then wanted to share that with everybody on Facebook who might not have celandines in their garden. People might not be able to go out to their green spaces and see as much as what he had in his garden. So his mentality then was to share that with everyone that he possibly could. So he did a live stream then. It was very shaky. I remember watching it and he was all over the place with his phone and he was reversing the camera and he was talking, but then it, it was looking the wrong direction. And then he's not brilliant on technology, I will admit. He's... Um, a little bit kind of all over the place. I have to kind of give him some hand, hand hand when it comes to Instagram and things like that. So, but he managed to do a Facebook Live, which was quite good. And then he started doing them every single day. And this is when things started to pick up because he had to go to work at this time. He had he was filming something in a um, a wildlife rescue sanctuary, so he went off to do that. He didn't want to forget about the live stream, so he asked whether I would take over. And at this point in time, I think he was getting a few thousand views a day, and I remember being really very nervous about taking over his Facebook page and talking. I think I did a piece about the um, different types of feathers that you can find on a bird and why it's important that they've got all these different feather types, everything from the pi primary feathers, uh, everything to you know the really fluffy feathers that keep them nice and insulated. Um, so that is how something called the Self-Isolating Bird Club was born. Um, and then very quickly we brought in Fabian Harrison and Kate Crocker to help and it became this kind of produced, um, I guess kind of show, I suppose, and we did them every day throughout lockdown for an hour. And it became the most amazing, awe-inspiring community because, of course, we've all gone through the most horrendous thing this year. We've all been isolated from the people that we love. We're, you know, struggling in terms of communication and everything became virtual. Um, but I do think that people found this kind of renewed connection, this new connection to one another through their newfound love of wildlife and whether that was something that they were finding for the first time or whether that was something that they, you know, had already engaged with and just kind of connecting with the community. It became this most amazing thing, this group on Facebook where people could ask questions about what to do, how to improve wildlife for their gardens. Um, you know, what is this bird? I saw it earlier. Can anyone tell me? It became this kind of constantly evolving, constantly shaping group of people and the support in it was just amazing. And then from that point, from South Isle Dating Bird Club came the opportunity to, um, to go and do spring watch and it was the first time i'd ever done live tv i'd been presenting on tv actually since 2017 a lot of the stuff that i did was international so i am a trained zoologist and a lot of what i did is predatory behavior based so i spent a lot of time working with sharks and big cats um all over the place and traveling quite a lot to do so uh, obviously traveling you know i'm very careful now how i travel because of the ecological climate crisis and also um you know it's nice to really engage with wildlife in your own garden, which has definitely been, been what this year's taught me. Um, so yeah, so Spring Watch, I started looking more and more, of course, about the wildlife around me and totally, totally fell in love with it. And that's gonna be what I'm talking about today with you guys. I'm gonna kind of um, go into what's really important in terms of citizen science. And then I'm gonna show you, by well, introduce you to probably some characters actually that if you watch the watches, you'll already know. Um, the badgers became a bit of a sensation. So I'm gonna share some photos, I'll share some videos of our beautiful badger clan that um, haven't been shared before actually. So you'll get to see some of those and I'll talk a little bit about the genetic about why they're so different. Talk a little bit about what I get up to in spring to try and encourage and help wildlife in ways that we can all kind of group together um, and make it a better world for our environment. Um, so I know, of course, you know, we're, we're all critically aware of the bad news that comes with our environment these days. I mean, it just seems like bad statistic after bad statistic. We know that the climate is changing, that biodiversity is in crisis. We know that we're losing species at an unprecedented rate up to a thousand times greater than the natural extinction rate that would be happening without human uh, pressure. So of course this is you know gravely concerning and I'll get more onto that a little bit later on and about how we can cope with the pressures of that and about how we can motivate one another to, to make things better. Um, but one thing, you know, that we all can do, and it's so, so, so important, is be a scientist. And when you, I say the word scientist, you probably think of somebody with white frizzy hair, a lab coat, think of, you know, back to the future. Um, and this is actually something that I've been talking a lot about recently is, you know, what is a scientist? 
because ultimately we always have these views of people in labs with magnifying glasses or um, you know typically stereotypically you know I get commented all the time saying that I'm not a scientist because I wear makeup and I'm female so we have to constantly always try to push the boundaries of what a scientist is because in my opinion every single person is a scientist everybody can go out and make subjective uh, you know ideas about okay, that wasn't there before, you know, this is a species that's appeared on my back garden, and that's, you know, a piece of data that you've, you might not have kind of written down, but you've noted it, and therefore you're kind of collecting more and more information, and you're constantly, subconsciously perhaps, making these discoveries, and making these analyses all on your own, and when we come collectively together to do so, and data is formed, and we engage in citizen science, that is the most powerful thing that we can do. And citizen science is something that anybody can engage in, no matter where you're from, uh, what you do. It's something so simple. And I think sometimes, you know, when you talk about citizen science and particularly something like bioblitzing, which is a really great activity to do in your garden or your local green space, um, you know, going out and identifying which species are there um, is a really kind of simple thing to do. And I think a lot of people get off put because they think you have to know and be able to identify everything. That's not the case whatsoever. It's really not. I mean, I'm the first to admit that I can't identify everything. I don't know everything. Um, and there's so many great resources online that means that you can print out a sheet and you can go into your garden and you just spend an hour and you tick off certain things. Um, and we're really interested in, of course, of understanding how species are moving throughout the environment. We're interested in understanding how dynamics between species are changing. And this can be really important through observations in gardens and parks and wherever everyone is. Um, so we actually, in 2018, Chris and I embarked on a national bioblitz scheme. I don't know if anyone remembers that. We made a bit of noise about it on social media and we went around to 50 conservation sites around the UK and we did it in 10 days. So we averaged about five or six sites per day. Um, it was quite long, long hours in the car. We went around to Northern Ireland, Wales, Scotland. Uh, and England and we basically visited these sites and the aim was to get what well, sites brought in recorders so species recorders people that really kind of were at the cutting edge of their specific um, group of animals you know, whether that's invertebrates and amphibians whatever, they really kind of knew how to identify and what to look out for in these specific habitats so they had the species recorders there uh, and it was also open to the public so people could come in it was a family day out and you know they had kids involved i think we had about 780 people over the course of 10 days come to take part in the bible it's around the uk um, and essentially what we asked each site to do is take 24 hours out so initially at the start of the day they had maybe from 12 p.m to 12 p.m the following day and they bible itched throughout that entire time of course then you get the idea of what's there at night and all these different time frames and it was the most amazing experience because getting around, getting to go around and meet all these different scientists and experts in their field was really inspiring. But it created a data set whereby we could understand exactly where the pulse of British wildlife was. We could understand how it was, uh, how it was doing, you know, what was there so that when it came to doing it the following year, we would know how things had changed. And that's really important. And overall, we got over 4,800 different species throughout the UK. And that's all thanks to the amazing recorders and volunteers and families that turned up at these different sites over the 10 days. And it was incredible because we found new species at sites that we didn't know existed. We found something, right, called the, um, the sun bog dance spider. Yeah, sun bog dance spider. How cool is that? I mean, it's a great name. I really like species names. I think, you know, the more creative and abstract, the better. And that one really got to me. It's a beautiful spider. It's got kind of a black abdomen, a black thorax and head, and these quite yellow um, legs. And it's a tiny, tiny little thing. And I remember the recorder who found it. This was up in Calaverock, I think, in Scotland. And it's an incredibly very rare um, little spider. And I remember him running up and he had it in a test tube. And so excited because you never see them. Um, but getting to do these bioblitz, I mean, it basically focuses our attention. You know, we're not just passing through. If we know we're looking for things, then we find a lot more and we're able to understand distribution a lot more effectively. So that was really great. So going around to all those different sites, collecting that data is really important. So the more that we can engage in citizen science, the more we know how things are currently and how we can do better to change it going forward. So, um, yeah, I'm really a big fan of all things data, everything, you know, if you don't know what things are, that's great, take a photo and go back and look in an identi identification book. I remember as a kid, 
Um, I, I had the weirdest birthday parties, as you would imagine, growing up with Chris. I remember, um, well, I, I say weirdest. I mean, I thought they were kind of cool. Um, my friends, on the other hand, when they came to a moth identification birthday party, um, raised an eyebrow. And I, had, I used his um, moth traps and collected all the moths that I could. And, and the following day, I'd have a sleepover with all my friends and then I'd get everyone up to identify moths all day. I thought it was great fun. But, it, you know, all that, stuff, all that data is then inputted into different charities and uh, it goes a really long way in helping the population. So anything like that you could do, obviously, the forest and big garden. But watch the wildlife trust doing brilliant things uh, on that front. So keep up to date and enter as much data. If you see things, you can go onto their website, I believe, um, and you can log uh, everything that you found. So please, please do that. If you're seeing things for the first time, let us know. We'd love to hear about it. Um, so. Anyway, so that's one really important thing, but I thought maybe we should go to badgers because they're very sweet and everybody really loves them. Um, so I was gonna share a few photos. So I'm gonna go between talking to you like this and sharing my screen. Um, hopefully there'll be a few images there for you to see, a few videos as well coming up. Um, and yeah, if you think of any questions, keep them in your head and um, put them in the chat later on, I'll get around to answering as many as I can. Um, so let me see, let's see if this will work. Here we go. Hopefully you can all see this, I think so. Um, so this is our badger set, I say our badger set, I mean it's the closest badger set that I've got um, close to my home, this is in the new forest. Um, and so I really got to know these badgers over spring. Um, I if initially actually, I started sitting up in a tree um, quite far away from them and at that point you could see how many there were and I'm going to show you a video of them later and you can see the scale of the set and the scale of the clan because it's absolutely huge but you know they're such a beautiful beautiful animal one of our most iconic species of course that we have in the UK and uh, throughout the course oh, I'm just seeing if I can there we go um, throughout the course of lockdown Chris and I were going there um, quite often and they got really used to our scent. They've of course got a very very keen sense of smell um, and they kind of got to know Chris and I's scent so they actually kept coming closer and closer. I'd always recommend that if you are badger watching, it's a brilliant thing to do if you can do it safely. You want to stay downwind and of course keep far enough away that you don't disturb the badgers. We ended up digging a hole. I'm actually in the, here I'm actually in a hole in the in the dirt. Actually I think this is Chris's photo. I might paint this is Chris's photo. So he's lying in a in a dirt hole here that we've dug purposefully so that we can get really low down to the badges um, so that we can look up at them with this wide angle and get this effect. Uh, you know, when you're photographing animals, it's always best to be on their eye line. Um, and they became so habituated to us that eventually, I remember being out there one day, and this is probably, this photo was taken at about 6, 7 p.m. Um, in, in late spring. So they're kind of coming up when the sun's still out there. So it was a great opportunity to get some photos of them in golden sunlight. And um, one that got so close that it actually bopped its nose on my camera lens. And I remember being so surprised because a badger had never, ever come that close to me before. And I'd never seen anything like it. But of course, the most distinct thing about this species is, of course, their markings. They've got absolutely stunning markings. And what you see there, the stripe on the head actually evolved, you know, a really long time ago, I believe. So we've had badgers for over half a million years in the UK, um, fossil evidence suggests. And the stripe above the top of their head, we believe evolved to essentially warn predators. So badgers lived in the UK when wolves and bears were also here, and they would have been the top predators of the badgers. Of course, they don't have that pressure anymore, but they've still got these really distinct markings. Um, and we believe that these stripes essentially pointed to their jaws because their jaws are actually incredibly strong. Badgers are you know, a very, very strong mammal. They're very, very bulky. Um, so yeah, that's why they've got those beautiful markings there. Um, and you can see as well the gorgeous guard hairs. So that would be around behind their ears. They've got these really long, coarse hairs that they use for a pilo erection. So when they're fighting with one another, they put them up a bit like kind of a lion's mane almost to make themselves look a lot bigger than they are. Um, but it was the most amazing experience just getting to know these badgers because you got to know them as individuals. Um, and then you start seeing something pretty spectacular here we are here's one of the others it's really great when you get low down because you get this out of focus light which is really nice so in the forefront here you can see it's called bokeh so you've got these out of focus bokeh lights at the at the front and at the back as well highlighting this beautiful badger um but then of course we have something special <laughs> in this clan um because we have different color variations which is not 
unheard of in badges. It's not too uncommon, but it's, it's definitely something that you don't see every single day. Now, this individual here uh, is one of last year's cubs, and it is an aesthetic badger. Um, so aesthetic badgers are basically, it's a, a change in their genetic makeup. It's a partial loss of pigmentation. Um, so basically all types of uh, pigmentation come from melanin. There are diff five different types of melanin altogether, and it's a mixture of these different types of melanin that produces the, sig uh, the significant pigmentation of any animal. Um, and we all share these different types of melanin. Um, and with the badgers, the main two types of melanin that are responsible for pigmentation is something called eumelanin and pheomelanin. Now eumelanin is responsible for the black and brown pigmentation and pheomelanin is responsible for red pigmentation. So when it comes to aesthetic individuals like this one, essentially what we're seeing is a reduction in the uh, eumelanin and basically an overproduction of pheomelanin, the red pigmentation. So they don't produce that black marking um, and they've got this kind of rose, gold, pink kind of colour. Absolutely stunning. We don't think it impacts their survivability at all. Um, you know, as a nocturnal animal, it shouldn't really matter quite so much. Um, but I mean, they are just absolutely stunning. To look at um but of course you get kind of albino as well a lot of these badges get mistaken as albinos um albinos would be pure white and they would have no pigmentation in their eye other than red so you'd see all the way through to the blood vessels at the back of the eye which gives albino eyes that red coloration um, and then you've got leucistic animals as well which are similar to albino in that they're all white however in the eye you do have kind of color pigmentation so a leucistic animal would have maybe brown eyes and all white fur and then you've got aesthetic and then you've got um melanistic individuals as well now melanistic are slightly rarer in badges than aesthetic melanistic individuals would be entirely black so the eumelanin would be overriding the pheomelanin which is the the red one so the black would take more dominant it's something that you see quite a lot on in panthers, um, you know, talking about big cats. I mean, panthers actually aren't, don't exist whatsoever. They're just melanistic jaguars or leopards. Um, so, yeah, it's, you've got lots of different genetic variations which create these different types of pigmentations. And it's all because of recessive genes. So both parents have to have the gene um, for aesthetic. Uh, aristotic gene or they have to have the melanistic gene in order to pass on to their offspring and um, so that is what we're seeing here so that means of course that there are quite a few of these individuals in in our group so this is when I'm sat up in the tree this is quite early on in springtime um, and you can see how many individuals there were let's have a look have a listen as well and turn it up hopefully you can hear Uh, how do I get rid of that? Oh dear. There we go. Um, so yeah, I hope you could hear that as well. You can hear the vocalisations. Good. Seeing some nodding, so that's good. Um, yeah, they are honestly the most charismatic animals. I've just totally fallen in love with those badgers. Um, they really are incredibly funny to watch, the way that they kind of bicker with one another and interact. We had, at the most, 17 individuals. Um, now this is quite unusual, this is a very very large clan, normally you don't get more than about 10, um, you know, but you can have much smaller than that. Um, so it was a very kind of large group and um, they that number since doing Winter Watch they have declined so they have dispersed, a lot of those cubs from this year will have gone out. Um, so I think now we're at, I think on Winter Watch we counted eight, I believe, by the end of Winter Watch, but um, haven't been up there since, so I need to go and double check that and check on how they're doing, particularly now spring is starting and they're coming out of their torpor, their semi-hibernation, they don't go into hibernation, they go into something called torpor, where they go into this rest-like state where they sleep a lot more and they slow their metabolism down slightly. 
just to get through the winter um, and they're just slightly less active so they'll be boosting up their activity now um, in fact the females will start actually kind of giving birth at this time of year so um, they'll be they mate all year round they do something called delayed implantation so badgers will mate all the time um, but then they will uh, females will only produce uh, reproduce once every year um, and cubs are born around kind of late February time so they'll be underground for about 12 weeks before they start coming out and be uh, being more active and engaging in kind of those adult behaviors which they develop actually really quickly um, so they do become like miniature animals pretty quick uh, but what I wanted to show you was a badger skull um, because I think skulls are really fascinating. They're perhaps some of the most amazing pieces of biological architecture in the world. They've got an incredibly strong skull. I mean, the thickness of the bone is much larger and it feels a lot thicker. And, and that's because, of course, they were heavily predated by things which had a very strong bite force, bears and wolves, when they were once roaming the UK. So they do have a very, very strong um strong skull and what they have here is something called a sagittal crest now a lot of animals that are predators have this um, but actually the badger has a quite a large sagittal crest and what it does is it's, it's got a muscle that attaches to the top of the skull and it goes down through the orbital here and it attaches to this ridge on the bottom of the jaw and what that allows the badger to do is have a very powerful bite itself and badgers certainly do have a very powerful bite. I mean, they mainly predominantly feed on earthworms, particularly in spring and summer. And when you, if you see a badger, if you ever come across a dead badger, um, have a look inside its mouth. I mean, I always do this if I find a dead badger anywhere, because what you can often see, if it's died of old age, what you see is the molars right at the back are often quite worn down. And that's because of all the dirt on the earthworms that wears their teeth down right at the back. Um, but during the winter time, they'll be feeding on kind of pretty much anything they can find. You know, they're quite opportunistic omnivores, so um, they'll be feeding on different kind of fruits that have fallen down just to get them through through the winter. Um, but it's an amazing, amazing skull. Um, and they one thing that's always really struck me about badgers, I'm going off on a tangent now, but I do think this is really interesting, is as a nocturnal animal, you know, they've got incredibly small eyes. And when you think of other nocturnal animals, you think of things like owls, you think of rodents. For their body size, they've got very large eyes, but badgers don't. Um, so it's quite interesting. And as a, as a kid, I always wondered why that was the case, because they their eyes are so, so tiny. And what it is, is a trade-off. Of course, for owls and rodents, they need to have bigger eyes to allow more light in and allow more eye, uh, light to reach the retina. And then that allows them to develop a better picture of their environment, allows them to kind of just to see a lot more clearly. With the badgers, on the other hand, they spend a lot of their time underground, of course. Um, so there's not much light getting in there, if any at all. So it's a bit of a trade off. Why invest a lot of energy in having large eyes when you spend 60 to 70 percent of your time underground where there's no light anyway and you have to remember in that underground environment there's a lot of dirt um so if you don't have large eyes then you're less likely to get kind of infections and to get them cut or anything like that so that's the reason why we think badgers have small eyes is of course because they live underground and not much point but yeah so they're pretty remarkable but it does mean that their other senses are very acute they've got a very acute sense of smell i'm not sure if you've ever been up upwind of a badger has anyone ever been upwind of a badger? I bet it didn't last long because I bet it would have got a sniff of you and it would have run away very quickly um, because they do have very sensitive noses. And if you look inside, they've got these nasal tissues. Now, every animal has this pretty much. You can have a look inside and see all of that. And there's not been much um, scientific study done on the olfactory, the kind of the nose of the badger. Um, but one thing that has been done on the American badgers is looking at the kind of the square um, square centimeters of the tissues, and if our Eurasian badgers are similar, which they are, um, the so the American badger has I think it's like over three hundred square centimeters of tissue in its nose, and in comparison to us humans, we are nine. So that goes to show just how sensitive their noses are, and it's incredibly important when they're out and about. Uh, of course, looking for those earthworms and looking for um, any kind of prey that they can find and also kind of communicating with one another. So this is my badger skull, uh, which I'm pretty in love with. Um, but of course, I can't talk about the badger without talking about the fox. Um, as a comparison, you can see, oh dear, this is another 
another difference with the fox skull is that the jaw comes off, whereas the badger has a hinge. So the bottom jaw is actually locked on in the badger, which isn't in the fox. So I have to hold this one slightly more carefully. But you can see the difference in size there. Um, the badger, I'll hold it this way, is kind of a lot more rounded. Uh, the fox is slightly elongated uh, and slightly narrower as well. And the fox doesn't have a sagittal crest like the badger does either. So that's something to look out for if you ever come across a skull um, and how to identify them. But um, yeah, fox skull, this I have to be very careful with because Chris has had this since he was a child. And I said to him, I'm going to pinch some of your skulls. And he looked at me like, okay, but <laughs> you be very careful with this one. So I have to take very, very good uh, protection of it. I've got lots of bubble wrap to wrap it up in when I'm finished, because I wouldn't want to be on the end of that phone call when I tell him um, something happened to it, which it won't be totally fine. But I know he doesn't have much trust in me when it comes to things like skulls. But um, it's, it's a really special skull, I think. It's amazing the kind of information that we can get. Um, if you were watching Winter Watch, we did a piece which I've found really fascinating about domestication syndrome. So there was a study in Russia in the 1960s where scientists uh, took in a lot of foxes and they tried to domesticate them and they were highly successful in that domestication. So what they did is they brought in all the foxes and they only bred the least aggressive individuals and they ended up with foxes that were that had floppy ears that essentially barked like dogs in a very similar manner um, and behaved very similarly to, to our dogs as well. And the fear of humans had drastically reduced. Um, and a scientist recently in the UK, who I think lives up in Scotland, uh, was walking around his city, I think he was walking around Glasgow, and a fox came incredibly close to him. Now, wherever you live in the UK, the chances are you have foxes living around you, which is one of the most incredible things, I think, for engaging people with wildlife is to go out and see a fox because it's one of the largest mammals that we have in the UK. Um, and they are quite accessible um, if you go out and try and find them and you can hear them. Most people hear them. Some people don't know what they are. They think they're quite freaky, particularly when those breeding calls come um, in kind of like late winter. They're, they're kind of finishing up now, but um, they're quite haunting, aren't they? So, But it's something that everyone can connect to and everyone can relate to. So foxes are always a really great starting point when it comes to engaging people with wildlife. Um, and so this scientist was walking around his town and a fox came so close to him and he thought that's really odd because that's the first time that's ever happened and that's a change in behaviour. Um, so he decided to look at this again and he investigated 111 different skulls. Um, these were from museum collections all across the country. I think about 54 were female, the rest were male. And um, he looked at the difference between skull shape in urban environments and rural environments. Um, and what we're essentially seeing is evolution happening within our lifetimes, which is incredible, because most of the time you think of evolution, it's quite a broad upscale thing that is quite hard to comprehend because it is just so vast and takes such a long time. However, we're seeing fox evolution happening very, very quickly. So the foxes that live in our towns and cities are actually gaining a longer snout than that in our rural environment and essentially what they're doing is they're changing the morphology of their skull to better uh, predate better kind of eat and find and locate and handle human food so whether that is wrapped in plastic whether that's in our bin bags whether that's in our dustbins they're developing their skulls in order to access that food better because in um, our urban environments, you know, about 40% of their diet consists of anthropogenic food. They'll still go out and they will still catch live prey, um, but they will also rely on, on people and scavenge. And why wouldn't you? It's a free meal and it's often quite fatty. So that's, you know, a really good thing at all times of the year. Um, so that's, we're seeing essentially real life domestication happen within our foxes. Um, which I think is really quite fascinating, a difference there. And people are now looking into the dentition, so they're looking into how um, their teeth structure is changing. We think that the carniceral teeth of the foxes in rural environments are getting kind of a, a longer than that of ones in urban environments, simply because they are catching live prey and they have to handle live prey, which is slightly more tricky than, say, opening your dustbin and having a rummage around. Um, there's always a, a fox in, <laughs> in the whole dustbins, but... Um, yeah, uh, we, we tend to kind of, we do feed our foxes, but I always say, a lot of people ask me, you know, is it okay to feed your fox, foxes that are around? Um, I'd always say, you know, yes, because that's, I've always done that. Um, but there are 
you know certain things to be aware of you know I always feed the foxes as far away as possible from myself as far away from any other people so that the foxes don't come habituated to uh, being next to people and associating humans with food because whilst they might get used to you they might come up to you and start asking for food they might also come up to somebody who's not quite as keen on them um, and there's still kind of a lot of work to do in terms of changing fox reputations around because in some cases they are still persecuted so um, do be careful with that but um, they're a brilliant thing to kind of encourage and to see and to engage with wherever you are um, and I do have some photos actually I was going to share with you so I will share um, where is it this one? Ooh, can you see this one here we are um, so off from our badges now this is such a beautiful image. So, so beautiful. Uh, of course, Red Fox, it, it couldn't be anything else. Absolutely stunning. And those characteristic ears as well, essentially act, acting like satellite antennae. Um, really important, particularly when the fox is in the environment in which it's in in this photo. When it's in snow or when it's in dense thicket or um, shrub or you know heavy grasses, because they're constantly listening out for the sounds of rodents in the undergrowth. So these big ears help them pinpoint exactly where that food is and also exactly where it's coming from and, and, and how best to pounce on it. Um, and foxes often um, do the characteristic pounce. If you see fox cubs, often what you find them doing is that learning to pounce strategy where they kind of go up on their hind legs and they bounce down on their forelegs and using their ears and put their head in the snow. If you've seen those videos of them diving head first into snow. Well, that's um, exactly what they're doing. Um, but there's been, you know, amazing studies. And again, we did mention this on Winterwatch, but I think it's so interesting and so new and exciting. It's really worth repeating. Um, so what we know now is that foxes use the Earth's magnetic field in order to locate their prey. Um, so we're not entirely sure how. There's still, you know, in terms of how birds use the Earth's magnetic field when it comes to migration, there's still many, many conversations going on about exactly how they do that. Um, whether it's just the Earth's magnetic field, whether it's something called manganite, which is in their bones and potentially towards the base of their bill, um, which helps them navigate. Foxes, we're still not sure. There could be something in the eye, we believe, that might, but essentially they might literally be able to see the Earth's magnetic field through essentially a shadow on the iris. So they're able to kind of pinpoint what's north, east, south and west. And what we scientists have discovered, which is just incredible, is that when they do that characteristic pounce on their prey, if they pounce in a northeasterly direction along that line of the Earth's magnetic field, then the success rate is increased by 84%, which is just huge. Whereas if they pounce in any other direction, the success rate of the pounce is much, much lower. Um, you know, it's around the 18, 19%, if that. So that makes a huge significant difference pouncing in a northeasterly direction why not a hundred percent sure um it's still kind of trying to work that out i believe but it's an interesting ongoing investigation um it's the first case of any mammal not just being able to judge in which direction to jump but also the distance in which to jump so you see as well, if they align themselves northeast, the reason why they get that significant, huge boost in percentage of success rate is because they're able to judge the distance at which their prey is from them. How? Again, not 100% not sure, but it's an amazing piece of science and um, something that we're still learning a lot about, which is really, really exciting. But um, yeah, so it's fascinating, this whole domestication syndrome and how they use the earth magnetic field. It goes to show that even the species that are around us all the time, species that we know and we love and we think, you know, we've learned everything there is to know about them. It couldn't be further from the truth. And there's always so much more to learn and much more to understand, especially when it comes to trying to understand different senses. Often as humans, we are restricted to the limitations of our own senses. We think about, you know, seeing, smelling, hearing, touching, but we don't think about the senses that other animals possess. And therefore, you know, these animals are experiencing the environment in an entirely different way than we are, in a way that we can't even comprehend and imagine. And that makes things incredibly hard to study. Because if we can't understand it, we can't kind of really get a grasp on it in that sense, then it's really difficult to design experiments. But these experiments are starting to happen. And we're starting to understand more and more what it's literally like to be a fox, to look through its eyes, hear with its hearing system, to smell with its nose. Um, so 
slowly but surely you know more revelations are coming up and they're incredibly exciting because it takes us out of our own limitations and into their world which i think is really important and something that we should be trying to consider more is getting into their world and and you know it's not just um protecting the planet from what we think they need but we'll have a better understanding of you know how they use their environment and therefore we'll be able to know what we can do to try and help um, protect their environment in the future um, so in, uh, I think it was May, um, there was a huge crash at the window. Um, now I live in the New Forest, very lucky to do so. It's a beautiful place, um, lots of biodiversity going there. It's absolutely stunning, full of life, um, which is one of the reasons we created the South Isolating Bird Club was to try and share that with people throughout the course of lockdown. And um, I remember this huge crash at the window. It was honestly, I thought the table had fallen over, I thought a window had been broken. Um, the poodles at the time were outside and they just went absolutely ballistic. Um, and it wasn't your kind of average great hit that bumped into the window. It was this. So this is a female goshawk. Um, and we were incredibly lucky this year because uh, a pair had started to nest about 400 meters away from Chris's house. So throughout the course of lockdown, we were walking the dogs, of course, on the lead um, around kind of close to where the nest is, kind of keeping tabs on what was going on. Um, now, in the UK, we think there's somewhere between 280 to 430 breeding pairs of goshawk. Uh, we know that they were going to heavily persecuted in the 1800s and the population has been increasing ever since. And their strongholds really are Wales and southern Scotland. Um, but we're really lucky to have a few breeding pairs as well, kind of down where I am um, in the New Forest. And also, I don't know if you know Indy Green, he featured on um, SIBC quite a few times and also on Winter Watch. He's got an avid love for goshawks. And of course, well, how could you not? They're one of the most you know, incredible predators uh, and one of the most beautiful birds. Um, and Indy's been seeing a lot of them up in Sherwood Forest where he is. Um, and they really are a, a sight to see. I mean, they're so ferocious in terms of, you know, they're hunting and they're so beautiful. So this is actually one of the juveniles that was in the nest. And unfortunately what happened, it was chasing a bird, we believe around Chris's house and it uh, flew into one of his windows. Now it, we found it and it was on the ground and the poodles were barking at it. And um, we managed to get the poodles away pretty quick and pick her up, put her in this box and we took her to the Hawk Conservancy uh, I'll stop sharing my screen for a minute. We took her to the Hawk Conservancy, um, which are the most amazing charity. They do so much for birds of prey conservation around the UK. They also have a bird of prey hospital, um, which is you know pretty much one of a kind. Uh, and it's just the work they do is simply phenomenal. They're a lovely, lovely group of people. And we brought her in um, and said, you know, we think she's okay. She feels quite underweight. You could feel a T-bone here was very, very pronounced. Um, and clearly, as you can see on that photo there, they look like an injury on the foot. So um, she stayed in there for a couple of, um, I think she was in there for about four weeks, maybe five weeks, had a bit of uh, rehabilitation. She was looked over by the vet um, and she needed an operation on her toe. We believe it was an injury that wasn't sustained by hitting the window, but it was actually sustained in the nest um, because it was, it was a toe that had been broken for quite some time. So she had surgery on the toe um, and luckily made a total full recovery. And we were then able to release her live on South Isolating Bird Club, which was amazing, right back into the woods where she was reared and fledged from. Um, so that was one of the highlights of spring. I mean, obviously I would rather that didn't happen and I you know, hope that she would be okay. It's almost, you know, crashing into our window. You know, she got the help that she needed for that toe, luckily. So it was, you know, all in all, it turned out to be a really good situation. And it's always an amazing opportunity to see a bird like that up close because you could see the details of their eyes. I mean, smelling a goshawk. I mean, I'm turning into Chris now, but smelling a goshawk is, you know, they do smell pretty great. They do really do. Um, and it was, you know, having watched the parents all spring and kind of being hearing them very noisy I was quite surprised by just how noisy they were but being the top predators and nesting quite high up in the treetops I suppose you can kind of get away with being noisy because you don't have to worry about too much coming to get you um because you're getting everything else <laughs> so um yeah so they were they were very noisy and, and wasn't too fussed by the poodles luckily so and the poodles were not so fussed by it I think more confused by you know you're not the usual great tip that 
kind of comes by. So, um, yeah, that was part of the, you know, amazing experience of spring. Um, but I will share my screen again with you and get back to a couple more images. Um, one of the other things that I really love doing is um, I, call, I, call it, I call it toading or frogging or newting, um, whatever it is that you happen to find. Um, so often at this time of year, the rain start coming, things start getting a little bit warmer and our amphibians wake up from hibernation. Now, it's always quite surprising for people, I think, because um, things like toads, for example, spend a lot of time hibernating in terrestrial environments. They spend most of their life, actually, in terrestrial environments rather than these freshwater environments that we see them breeding in the spring and summer. Um, but they kind of hibernate down in these burrows, in these woody areas, in a lot of kind of tree growth and uh, up, up in the, um, the leaf litter. Um, so that's where they'll spend the winter. And at this time of year, they'll start waking up, and particularly on a rainy evening, you will see a tidal wave of amphibians coming and they will travel quite some distance to get to their breeding sites. So they'll be traveling to, you know, your ponds or um, I don't know, your different kind of different systems that you might have around. And the one thing that you can do at this time of year is give them a helping hand along the way. Um, so they live on average, toads on average live to about 10 to 12 years old. So they do actually, you know, they did live quite a long time and that's quite a few migrations going to and from their breeding sites. Um, and on these journeys, a lot of the time there are roads. And this is a huge, huge, huge problem uh, when it comes to amphibians because of course they will cross the road and often the cars don't see them because they are so small. So at this time of year, what I like to do is get my high vis on, I get my bucket, I get my torch and I go out toading, frogging, newting <laughs> um, and try and help collect these toads and put them in buckets and take them to their breeding site. But it is um, a really important way, as I said earlier, of uh, citizen science at the same time, because then you're able to understand different population dynamics, how they're doing as opposed to last year. Um, but I wanted to show you this video of them because um, the noise is just so, so stunning. Have a look and a listen to, to this. So um, yeah, <laughs> it's quite a beautiful sound actually. So these are, these are all toads here and what you can do is I'll sort of show my screen again. Um, so what you do with the, these toads is of course you want to understand the males and females so you kind of get taught about how to identify male and female uh, typically due to size. Male females are a lot larger um, and also you want to notify how many are in amplexus which is when they're mating. So I never really appreciated the strength of a male toad but I have to say they're pretty strong pretty strong so what they do is the male toads will come and they'll latch onto the female's back even when they're kind of still breeding to their breeding and they will use his uh, front legs and essentially hook underneath the female's front arms and he is so strong on there and they go there's something when the two individuals uh, are together it's called amplexus and so you count how many are in plexus, you count the males and the females, you move them along across the road. Um, so that's always something that's really important to do at this time of year in the springtime, if you can get out. I mean, volunteering is still allowed um, during this lockdown. People are going out toading. I'm seeing lots of photos and um, a lot of people are seeing a lot of activity. Um, so right now is kind of prime time for movement. So if, you know, I found it was really great. I started doing it a couple of years ago, actually. And... I really loved it. I'd be out for about two hours every night and I might do a couple of evenings or three evenings a week and I'd go out down to my local lane um, and you can find the information online as to where you know these sites are that need particular help and they're all over the country, uh, all over the UK, so lots of different sites to go and look at. And then you kind of collect all, these, all this information and send it into a big database and it's really important, again, that science element to it. Everyone's a scientist and everyone can do something to help. So um, that was kind of a, a thought that, you know, that's what I get up to <laughs> in my spring time. Um, so it's a great thing for everyone to get involved and do. Um, share again. On to the video. Um, at this time of year, um, owls are also my, owls are my favourite thing any time of year. Um, but, you know, the tawny owls are starting to quiet down now, but it has been quite a noisy couple of months with the tawnies. Now, tawny owls are 
um, a species which breed quite early in comparison to a lot of other spring birders, so uh, spring breeders. So they start kind of their well, they've started their mating calls quite early in January. We were hearing them um, throughout the course of last year. I actually had a male tawny owl that sat above my bedroom window and um, proceeded to call the entire night, uh, which was really really lovely. Actually, I kind of fell asleep to it. It was quite um, relaxing actually I didn't like it when he stopped calling because I'd grown quite accustomed to falling asleep to his twit twooing uh, well the twitting and then the twooing from the female who was uh, on a perch just just around the corner from him but um yeah I mean they're a beautiful thing to see and particularly during the you know the winter time um they're easier to spot in some respects not so much tawnies that live in kind of the dense woodland um um but particularly things like uh, the barn owls, for example, are really good to see. Um, so I've got a bit of an affinity for barn owls. Um, this is me. Um, I was about, I don't know, five or six years old here. And this is a barn owl called Marmite. Now, Marmite belongs to the Hawk Conservancy, a tame barn owl. Um, a barn owl that I really fell in love with. Um, so growing up, my downstairs bathroom um, was often a rehabilitation room. So I would go in and come in from school I, you know, nip to the bathroom, but often there would be something else sat on the toilet, whether that would be a falcon, whether that would be, I don't know, a snake perhaps. Um, and one day I came home and Marmite was sat on the toilet. And um, I remember being totally besotted by him. He was a really beautiful barn owl. And I actually learned to fly birds um, with Marmite. And um, Chris often, you know, at this point in time, obviously kind of ethics and discussions around doing this have changed massively. I mean, this is this is probably you know two, the year two thousand. Um, so Chris used to kind of take Marmite around the, and use him for talks as an educational uh, kind of flag, flagship uh, for the species. And um, Marmite was really used to doing this. And I remember Chris got asked to do my school assembly, and um, and he agreed to do it. And we thought it'd be brilliant if you know Marmite could come and. Um, do some flying in the assembly room so that's what we decided to do and I learned to fly mar marmite in order to do this and the day came when we had to take marmite into school and to do this this kind of display with him and um, Chris called me up to stage and I was only this young and I remember being really excited because um, you know I just totally I spent all my hours sat in the sat in the bathroom with marmite for about a week I just spent every waking minute I possibly could with him um, and then to get to share him with a lot of my friends and my teachers was really exciting. And uh, Marmite flew once. Uh, he then, I tried calling him back and he decided, nope, not today, that's not gonna happen. Uh, and he flew up into the ceiling of the assembly room where he took a perch and sat for the next nine hours. So school ended and everyone went home and uh, Marmite was sat on the ceiling, which, you know, fair enough, it's a bird's prerogative, I suppose. Um, but, but we did manage to get Marmite down and I think from that point I really loved owls I think that's why my kind of obsession with owls came from um, was from Marmite and particularly barn owls in particular um, so this is a, a stunning photo of a barn owl and of course some snow again getting down at that eye level having that kind of out of focus foreground is really lovely in photographs it gives you a bit of depth perception um, and it really the colours in the background really kind of highlight um, this barn owl's colouring, absolutely stunning. Um, but it kind of a, a sad story from the barn owl in a, in a certain way. So in the 1980s, there was a huge conservation effort to, uh, I'll try and, um, I'll stop sharing my screen again. Um, there's a huge conservation effort to try and increase the population because population num numbers of barn owls had plummeted significantly. And what conservationists decided to do was to put up specific um, barn owl boxes, nest boxes for them. Um, the reason why they had plummeted was largely due to the increase of pesticides, you know, intensification of agriculture, um, reduction in kind of the natural food source, but also primarily uh, reduction in old barn. Of course, they're happily named barn now because they nest and live inside these old buildings, and a lot of those got torn down to make way for new sheds that simply didn't have the holes or the room or the type of environment they needed in order to survive. So there was a huge plummet and in the 1980s this huge conservation movement came and they put up these bird boxes everywhere and they really really helped they really did um and barn owls started nesting in them and it became a really popular a really um successful move actually it became really well and the numbers started to recover 
Um, however, recently, there's, you know, it's not been the best of news for barn owls because they are uh, a sensitive species. They are an indicator species that is very sensitive to the climate. Um, so they've got incredibly thin plumage. They need to, of course, for flying and to be incredibly silent. They're totally silent when they fly. They have to be in order to catch the rodents in those open environments where they hunt in open fields. Um, but this thin plumage means that when it rains, and we've had a lot more rain than we've ever done in a short period of time, and these cold snaps, it means that they don't have the insulation and they are unable to repel the water. They don't have waterproof feathers. They get incredibly wet. Um, and it means that they're unable to fly as well. It means that their prey is often warned that they're approaching because they aren't entirely silent. Um, and these cold snaps often, they're unable to stay warm. So if we have a really cold period of about over a week to 10 days, we see a, a significant decline in, um, in their numbers. Unfortunately, a lot, a lot of them do die uh, because it is warm enough. So we're starting to see, I mean, we've got quite northern barn owls. I mean, the most northern point of any barn owl population is Scotland. Um, that's as far north as their range. So we are kind of in the northern parts of their range. Um, but we are, of course, seeing the impacts of the climate crisis. It's happening all over the place every day. You know, we're seeing, you know, whether it was, it was the wettest day on record, wasn't it, recently? The, um, you know, we're seeing these little things and whilst we might not be picking up on, picking up on the details of them because they might be minuscule to us, for things like barn owls that are highly sensitive, they're going to be feeling the pinch first. And in fact, they're already feeling the pinch. So no matter how many um, bird boxes that we put up for barn owls, no matter how many nesting sites that we try to create, you know, if we don't think collectively about, um, um, about the climate crisis and we try and change our actions, then ultimately, you know, we're in a bit of trouble. So we've got to really focus on that and, and, and change. And there is a lot of positivity on that front, a lot of really great stuff. But that's, you know, not always the case for every bird, but a lot of bird species are, are significantly struggling, as you know. So I'm going to share um, my screen again to share kind of one last story of um, a, a nest that I got so lucky to visit in um, the spring. And um, it's of um, a bird that I'm sure many of you will know because it is a flagship bird species. It's absolutely you know, stunning. It's of all kind of birds of prey. It is the males in particular, very, very special. Um, so I went with a, a licensed um, individual, a registered individual to go and see a nest. So this is a nest of hen harrier. So these are three hen harrier chicks. And um, this is in Northern Wales, in a, a secret location in Northern Wales. Um, and I was allowed to go in, it's a registered species, so nobody should, you know, is it technically allowed to approach the nest unless for a valid scientific registered reason, um, because they are a very protected bird species. But to, so for me to be able to go and see them, I'd never seen hen harriers before. Um, and it was always something that I really wanted to go and do. And um, this year I got the opportunity to go to go and visit them. And I remember walking through the thick heather. I mean, the th heather was up to my knees. It was quite dense. It was a very remote location. Um, and I was kind of so focused on that that I actually almost tripped over the nest because it was so hunkered down in amongst the heather. I didn't see it coming. Um, and I just was, I saw it. And I remember, you know, it's one of those moments that all your hairs stand up on end and you're just so surprised and just elated by what's in front of you. And I think I just stayed still and quiet for the next three minutes. I think I was just stunned by them. Um, and then I kind of got to learn about exactly how um, they are monitored, which was really amazing. So these individuals here are about three weeks old. You can see that their primary feathers are developing and they've got their pins and their um, tail feathers that are starting to come through. So they are becoming adult birds quite quickly. Um, and the most interesting thing I found actually was we were able to sex them. Um, and I never knew this with birds of prey, but you can sex them depending on their eye color. So their eye color actually changes when they get into adulthood. But when they're young like this, if you look at their iris, you see the bird uh, right at the front on the right hand side, one with its bill open more than the other ones. Um, so that individual there is actually a male. And if you have a really look, a deep look, you can see that it's got quite a gray, slightly blue iris. Um, so that individual there is a male, as is the one directly behind it. And the one on the left hand side is a female because she's got a browner iris. So we were able to, to sex them that way. And the male there actually um, got tagged the following week. Um, so 
uh, I think actually in the following the following couple of days, so it got tagged with the transmitter, so they were able to understand its whereabouts, get a, an idea of how it was moving, how it was using that environment. Um, and they do, so at about four weeks old, so one week after the time that I went to visit, they'll start burrowing into the heather. So a lot of birds of prey, like the goshawk, for example, after they fledge, they'll go into the branches of the trees where they'll still be dependent on their parents bringing them food, but they'll be exploring their environment a bit more and going a bit further out. And um, hen harriers do this by nestling into the heather around, which is a really good thing, actually, um, considering that they can be predated on by foxes that come on in. Um, and they aren't most camouflaged with their grey feathers in the in the brown and green thicket. So actually, um, I'm not sure how they evolved <laughs> to be like that as a ground nesting bird, but they're not the most kind of camouflaged. So once they get into that heather, um, then then they do really well. And in fact, all three of them did brilliantly. And it was, yeah, an amazing, amazing experience to go and see hen harriers. You never really get to see them as chicks very often. So it's um, I thought I would share that one with you. Um, so yeah, this is me at the nest. You can see, I think I'm still in shock a little bit. I think my hands were shaking at the time, but um, yeah, a very, very special moment um, to go and see to go and see that in Wales. Um, so I wanted to kind of wrap up by talking a little bit about this. Um, now, I'm sure you've seen many pictures like this over the last couple of years. They've been coming up more and more um, as, well, not so much this year, of course, we were unable to meet and gather like we have done. Um, but I think it's really important that we talk about activism. Now, um, I remember I was on a university trip and my lecturer asked me, what do you want to do when you've finished, when you've graduated? And I said, well, you know, I, wildlife campaigning predominantly, I want to raise, you know, awareness, particularly illegal wildlife trade, I want to do things like that. And um, she's like, oh, so you want to be an activist then? And I couldn't, I remember sitting and I remember thinking about this for a really long time because I thought, you know, there's this kind of stigma around the word activist, which I think we really need to kind of change and readdress. Um, you know, because at the time, I mean, I'm guilty of it myself. When I, she said, do you want to be an activist? I was like, well, no, not really. Because I was, you know, as, as Boris Johnson put, what did he say? He said, um, mung bean eating, hemp wearing, uncooperative crusties, I think, um, was his terminology for uh, what I thought as an activist. And um, so at the time I was like, oh, well, well, I do do all of those things. But at the time I didn't, well, I, was, I was like, oh, well, no, I don't know. But, but thinking more and more about it in the following weeks to that conversation, I just thought, yeah, I am. everybody is an activist. If you do something in your garden, you're an activist. We all have different scales of what activism means. You can go out and feed the birds like many of us do in the UK. In the UK, we're a nation that we love feeding our birds. We do it more than anyone else in Europe. Um, we are all active in contributing to our environment. Even if you don't feed the birds, being a living animal, a great ape as we are, we're active within the environment in some way. So changing that stigma around what an activist is, is really important. And activism can mean different things to different people. You don't have to go out and protest every weekend. You don't have to go out and join, you know, the more extreme side of activism. You don't have to go out and get arrested as some choose to do, and that's fine, that's their choice. But you can do your own version of activism. I asked my little brother to get involved recently. My brother is 12 years old um, and I said, right, you know what we can do? We're going to post letters to our neighbours and we're going to say, do you mind if we put a hole in the fence for hedgehogs? And then do you mind letting your neighbours know so that you they can put a, hedge, a hedgehog highway in? And then we can have a long line of hedgehog highways um, going, through, going through the neighbourhood. And he thought that was really rebellious. He thought that was really great um, because he got to do something that was beneficial, that was important in kind of communicating those issues. Um, and for him, that was activism. And that is activism. You know, that's what activism is. It doesn't have to mean the extreme scale or the small scale. Every step is important. If you wake up tomorrow and do something different for biodiversity, then, you know, ultimately we're on the right path. If you do something different from the day you did yesterday, something slightly greener, something, you know, slightly better, then that's, you know, a positive. And everyone's got their own scale to do things. And there's been a lot of kind of finger pointing, I think, when it comes to, being green you know are you doing enough or you do that you do this that's not good enough you can't be green no you know that's not something that um you know i agree with and i think that actually turns quite a lot of people off i think we all 
can do what we can with our own, within our own capabilities. We've all got to um, strive to do better every single day. I strive to do better all the time. And, and I think that's something that we all work towards together and we all have to celebrate the little successes and we have to be more and more active as time goes on. And, you know, we're hearing many more words, you know, the nature uh, deficiency disorder, which we know is a problem. It's a huge, huge problem. You know, children these days spend, I think it's like 44 hours a week looking at screens at least. And um, particularly more so, of course, now that they're not in school and they're, you know, learning through Zoom, like we're chatting. You know, normally if I was doing a talk, I would probably come up and I'd be sat, you know, speaking to you all. And we'd all be, you know, there together in a, in a room somewhere. You know, now we're all looking at screens and we know that in some ways, you know, that can be benefit like there's been some really interesting science actually talking about you know like mental health and nature which is of course really important and even just looking at wildlife on a screen has almost as good an effect on our mental health as seeing it in person so there's that science coming out however we are still looking at screens and spending so much time on screens it does disconnect us and um, so you know nature deficiency disorder is a really difficult thing you know trying to get my brother out from the xbox to go and knock on the neighbor's door put a letter through the neighbor's door to talk about hedgehogs i mean it was a couple conversations but we got there in the end and he loved doing it because once he was out and connecting with that wildlife once he was out doing that i took him toading it was brilliant it was so good i mean it wasn't so brilliant because there wasn't any toads there and he was quite disappointed but we did a big litter pick and we came back with buckets of litter and he was, you know, saying, oh, we should do a video and we can share it and post it. And he's really good on the whole TikTok thing. For me, that goes, you know, right over my head. I mean, I draw the line at TikTok. Um, but he really loves it. And he posted it on his TikTok to share with all his friends. And ultimately, that's a different generation. So I think the way that we communicate these issues needs to change. You know, we, often we talk about it within our own echo chambers. We talk about it with the same language, you know, using the same language that we always have done. But we need to kind of get more and more people involved because ultimately the more people that are involved, the more diverse people that are involved actually is, is, is a really important point. The more diversity of ideas that we have, the stronger those ideas are. And if we can, you know, take away the barriers and talk to generations that are looking at their phones, so they'll go, oh, that's cool. Let's put down the phone and go and connect then, you know, we've got, a, we've got a winner there. So it's kind of working on how we can do that to spread the message out there because technology and social media is in, an incredibly important tool. Um, I use it all the time, but I'm also very aware to put it down um, to, to actually go and connect with things. If I'm ever, you know, like with, the, with those hen harriers, I took a couple photos, but then I made sure that my phone stayed away because you also want to enjoy those moments when it's right in front of you. Um, so I think that's a really, you know, important thing. Um, another thing that pops up is, of course, mental health and mental health is really important. And it's something that, you know, I know so many people. I mean, I've struggled with it throughout the course of lockdown. I'm sure we all have. It's been incredibly difficult. So, so hard all, all confined to our homes. Um, and nature has provided a lot of solace for us. It's been kind of the silver lining of this absolute hideous crisis that we've, we've all faced and are continuing to face. Um, and, and the term that gets kind of thrown around is eco-anxiety. Uh, it's not something that has been medically approved yet, um, but it is actually something that a lot of therapists and a lot of people are learning um, how to communicate on, is this idea of eco-anxiety. And a lot of people do kind of, you know, get a lot really stressed with the const con continuous declines and the bad news about the climate and, you know, destroying rainforest or peatland or wherever, whatever it is, whatever environment. Um, and it is, you know, it is a concern, but I do think that we have to use that feeling and turn it into something positive. You know, when we hear these bad things, I mean, often I hear them and I think, oh, am I, am I saying things loud enough? Am I making enough noise about it? Am I sending my letters to government? Am I sending them to the right people? Am I doing enough? And I think that's a common thought that we all have. Um, but I try then to kind of go to bed and I think, okay, that negative energy, that's still energy that I can use tomorrow in, and turn it into something productive that's still something that I can think okay that didn't quite work or that wasn't quite what I expected 
what can I do tomorrow to make it better? Because every single person has the power to make a difference. Every single person has the power to use their voice, whether that's getting out and recording nature in your garden, sending that in for citizen science projects so that everyone's got a clearer understanding of how our populations are doing, which is actually becoming increasingly important as the years go on because distributions of species is changing. We know that animals are moving further up north, they're moving higher up in altitude um, to kind of keep in within their temperature ranges as temperatures shift. Um, so we need to know how these animals are moving, because once we know how they're moving, we'll know how their environments are going to change and how they could come into competition with other species. So, you know, going out and monitoring what's in your garden and sending them into Sheffield and Rotherham Wildlife Trust is so important. So please, you know, please go and do that. And also bear in mind that, you know, we're all in this together um, and, you know, but make your voice heard because everyone is powerful and everyone's really important in the conversation and community. Um, so yeah, I feel like I've rambled for quite a while. I'm sorry, it's been a bit, it's been a bit all over the place, but um, I hope you've enjoyed it and I hope you've got some questions as well. So yeah. thanks all very much for listening. Thank you so much, Megan. It was so interesting and really engaging and some wonderful stories. Um, we do have um, quite a few questions, so <clears throat> um, we probably won't be able to get through them all. So I apologise um, if any of the questions get missed, but I will ask ask a few and then um, we'll see where where it goes so we've had quite a few um career advice questions so i'm just going to sort of sum them up and, and and badge them into one um so what would be your advice for someone who wants a zoology or conservation career and would you give any advice around volunteering or practical experience you would recommend or other courses or qualifications after a zoology degree you would recommend yeah, absolutely. There's so much that um, you can do. I mean, the more practical experience that you can get, it's really, you know, is the better, really. It's really important to go out and volunteer for as many different things as you can, as many different courses that you care about. Um, obviously, you know, the Wildlife Trust, look into what they're doing, see whether you can get in contact. I mean, send emails out to people. People are very receptive and often very grateful for the help because the more hands on deck, you know, it's, it's really needed at this point in time. Um, so yeah, get communicating with wildlife trusts that are around you, with all the different organisations that might be close by. Um, I started volunteering at a wildlife hospital when I was about 10. Um, so I was going in and I was feeding baby pigeons that needed rescuing and I was helping hedgehogs and um, learning about kind of, you know, all the different types of animals and how to look after them. And I think that that was really kind of important for me to understand kind of British biodiversity and also kind of start thinking about kind of like welfare and that side of it um but also you know have a have a look at different volunteer programs for sure i mean it depends kind of where your interest lies but try and dip your toe into as many different things as you possibly can because um there's so much different things out there within conservation and zoology it's really great to try as much um as you can because it's you know you want to give it a go before you kind of go full in Full steam into things and it's nice to be able to have that varied kind of experience of what you what you can try so definitely try out volunteering you know look at your local wildlife hospitals look at your local organization see what opportunities there are um as i said email get in contact and you know ask what you can do to help um as i mean i did it and talking about kind of qualifications i actually um so i'm highly dyslexic i'm severely dyslexic so i'm really bad numerically i can't the idea, if you'd have told me that I would have done a science degree in my secondary school, I would have probably shuddered in fear because I was so bad at maths. Really, I still am, honestly. I'm, I'm very, I hope no one's asked me the times tables because we'll be here all night. So, um, you know, I was really quite fearful of, 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 doing, of doing science because of that. So I, for a while, ended up wanting to do drama. And that, like, in hindsight, that quite helped me now in the career that I've done. But I went and did a few qualifications in that. And um, before I decided, you know, what am I doing? If I don't give science a try, because nature and wildlife is always what I wanted to do. But I didn't think I could do the kind of the chemistry or mathematics side of it. Um, but I kind of thought, well, you know, you've got to give it a go and try. Because if you don't try, then you'll never know. So I ended up doing a foundation year in biological sciences before I did my degree. And um, I found that really helpful, actually, really insightful, because it's essentially like your chemistry A-level maths and biology and physics kind of all in one year um, and kind of quite concentrated and I found that really good as a foundation for going into zoology because it gave me everything I needed to know and I could get a really good grasp on it so doing a foundation year was actually really uh, positive so that's always you know something to look into. 
Um, and then of course, after you come out, you can look into doing different master's programs and that's when you can really specialize in what you'd like to like to study and research. So um, lots of different options there for sure. Great, thank you very much for that. Um, so the next question is um, so a wildlife gardening themed question. Um, apart from feeding and providing a home, what are the top tips for attracting and protecting wildlife in your garden? Ponds, I'd say, ponds are so important. Uh, everything relies on water at the end of the day. So if you've got a freshwater ecosystem, um, then that is really important. And when I say pond, I don't mean, you know, get a spade and go and dig a huge pond. I mean, you can have quite small, simple, I mean, you can make a big one, that'd be great. But um, you can also just sink a washing up bowl into your pond, uh, into your garden. And then, you know, you'll have a functioning small freshwater ecosystem and you'll find things like frog spawn and frogs and you'll find, you know, lots of different things, dragonflies and different nymphs and eventually wildlife will start coming in. Um, you know, we've lost a lot of our freshwater habitats from the UK. It's actually one of our most threatened environments. Um, you know, particularly in terms of the health of it because of pollutants and everything. But ponds are really important, and particularly when it comes to climate, because they actually reduce the temperature, or, you know, of your immediate environment. So they're kind of really helpful when it comes to issuing, you know, um, solutions to climate change. And a lot of conversations are turning into, you know, in our big cities, should be putting more ponds in, not only to attract more biodiversity, but also, you know, for the climate. So ponds are really important. Of course, you can feed and provide homes for everything, but also, you know, think about what you're planting. You want things to flower um, at different times of the year. So if you have everything that flowers in spring, that's great for the kind of the spring pollinators and the spring feeders, but it's not so great for the ones that come out in autumn. So have a Google. And I'm not a brilliant gardener myself. I'm not particularly green fingered. I wish I was. I'm working on it. Um, but do kind of have a look about what flowers when and, and, and kind of time it. So you've got even kind of things that come up in the winter to, to support extra Kind of species that come in but um yeah the more biodiversity you can attract definitely the better and look at you know planting natives as well is really important so if you're looking at wild flowers um try and plant native as best you can because they'll be better suited to our native wildlife ultimately um, and you want to encourage that as much as possible thank you and talking about ponds someone has asked how do you attract pond uh, frogs to your pond yeah I mean, a lot of the time they will come naturally um you know they do kind of appear so um, we actually had, there was a pond that was, I don't know if you know, um, a lady called Kate, well, it's Kate McRae, um, and she had a pond that she built for Springwatch, and it was a feature a couple of years ago, and she kind of got this new house, and she made it all wildlife friendly, and it was a, a really nice series of films that she did on the watches for us. Um, and she put this pond in, and this year, I've literally, just before, actually, I, I started this talk, I was on Twitter, um, and I saw that she had frog spawn for the first time, and it took two years to get there, but it eventually did fine. So if you build it, they will come, <laughs> as they say. Um, so, yeah, just be a bit patient, and of course, with ponds, you want to um, add a bit of variety to it. So if you can put aquatic plants in, that's really good. It helps with the oxygenation. Make sure that you put in a, um, a ramp so that anything that falls in can get out. Um, some rocks and some stones are really good. Create hiding places so it's a bit sheltered. Also, if you can strategically place your pond so it's maybe half in sunlight, half in shade, you don't want it getting too hot, but you also don't want it getting too cold. So then you've got different environments there so wildlife can choose where it goes so yeah where you place your pond is kind of important but be patient because it does it will arrive and dragonflies will actually arrive quite soon and then frogs will arrive hopefully a little bit later thank you um are there actions we can take from home to help protect badgers from persecution yeah i think you know there's always something that everyone can do i mean if you know where your local badger set is that's you know really important you can you can volunteer with your local badger group um, that's something that you can go out and do. Um, but also it's talking about these issues. Now, some of the conversations around um, you know, badges and everything else are, you know, challenging. They're definitely challenging, but they're conversations that we need to have with one another to raise awareness. So the more that we talk about them, you know, when we, whether that's kind of sharing it on social media, whether that's letting your neighbours know, um, whether that is, I don't know, you know, letting... I would I would say your barman know, but not everyone's been to the bar in quite a while. But you know what I mean? Letting your postman know, letting people that you come across. It's about engaging in those conversations and having those uh, discussions because they are incredibly important. And people that might not be aware of badgers, you know, a lot of people in the UK, I'm always surprised by how many people tell me that they've never seen a badger. Um, so, yeah, I mean, even just kind of discussing badgers and, in, you know, increasing awareness about their plight um, is really important. So, 
get talking um, and, and keep updated with the science is what I'd say. You know, when it comes to these kind of issues, we always want to know the independent peer reviewed scientific papers because, you know, it's really important that we want to save everything. Of course we do as humans, you know, I want to save everything. I love, I love everything. Um, but it's, we've got to understand the science behind it. And that's where the strength comes is those independent peer review papers. So keep up to date with that. Keep reading, keep sharing, keep talking. And um, yeah, and keep, you know, join in on petitions, join in, write letters to government, like write letters to your local MP, because that goes really, my, my local MP is probably quite fed up with me because I'm forever writing in every other day about various different issues. Um, but, you know, keep being that, you know, annoying constituent, keep doing that. Um, because, you know, eventually we're, get, we're getting there. We are definitely getting there. <laughs> Thank you very much. And um, what is your favourite wildlife encounter you have come across? Oh, so, you know, these favourite questions are always really hard because it's so difficult to pick a favourite as such. Um, I'll, I'll speak with the, from the UK um, perspective. Um, you know, I, I, love, I really do love uh, seabirds. I think they're really fascinating. I love being by the ocean. Um, I think, you know, being in the water is really amazing. And I remember when I was about 12 years old, I went to Bass Rock. Um, and Bass Rock is home to gannets, one of the largest gannet colonies that we've got. And I remember being on a boat, taking photographs um, of them, trying to take photographs, being on a boat, rocky, 12 year old with a camera, was not so sharp phot photography wise. But I tried and I ended up getting some nice photos, but it was amazing because it was quite a, a boat that had quite kind of, uh, it was quite low down. And these gannets were just diving in all around us and it was the most amazing experience and um yeah it was quite entertaining trying to take photos of it at the same time but i remember i always remember that experience as being you know pretty special great thank you so much and i just have one last question for you so i do apologize to anyone who asked questions that weren't answered but we are running out of time we are running over so we'll just put one more question to you megan thank you um what's your funniest childhood memory with Chris? <laughs> oh dear, um, how long have you got? <laughs> we could be here all night. Dear, oh dear, there's lots of childhood memories with Chris. I think about what's the worst. Well, not the worst. I mean, he embarrasses me all the time, so I feel like sometimes it's only fair. Um, I mean, growing up with Chris was just, you know, I'm so lucky to have met him when I did. I was two years old when I met him, um, and he definitely showed me things that I you know, would never have got the opportunity to see or to learn or to understand and every day was incredibly different let's just say that because it was all educational stuff and he wanted to introduce me to everything wildlife related but then he'd also take me to the opera which he hates but he wanted to show me to kind of widen my eyesight so I and I owe him a lot really because he really um expanded my education and my kind of insight into the world so he'd take me to a punk rock gig then he'd take me to the opera then he'd take me to an art gallery and then we'd be back at the zoo or whatever doing this kind of thing I remember getting woken up once in the middle of the night it must have been about 3 a.m and I was only I can't have been older than about three or four years old but he says you know get dressed come on we've got to go come quick come quick so I'm like okay and I, I, he didn't tell me what was going on but I was put into the car in the middle of the night and drove and driven off and this is all you know kind of odd but it's you know normal in, in our household I suppose to some degree and um, we ended up at Marwell Zoo, and Marwell Zoo was my local zoo growing up. It was where I spent a lot of my time. I would always go there. I was obsessed with porcupines, obsessed. There was a male porcupine called Vicar that I would routinely adopt on a regular basis, and he was lovely. And um, so I'd be doing that. And uh, But on this occasion, we weren't going to see Vicar. We were going to the giraffe house because a female giraffe was giving birth. So we were sat at half three in the morning, kind of watching this female and for hours and hours she was in labour and everyone was staying back and peeking out and trying to see. But I remember this giraffe giving birth and how quickly this young giraffe was up on its feet. And that was, you know, one of the kind of oddest, kind of most amazing kind of things that he's done. But um, yeah, so I, going to see that kind of around the corner from the house was quite unusual. He liked to put everything on my nose. That was another thing that he did. He liked, you know, if I if, if I ever was fearful or slightly fearful of anything, as young girls often are, um, they'd often end up in my bedroom or on my nose. So my, my bedroom was kind of, and it sounds a bit odd, but um, my bedroom had a lot of different insects in it. So I had praying mantises, I had uh, uh, tortoises, I had leaf insects, 
I had, uh, I haven't had the fluffy stuff too, the gerbils and everything. And I remember one time saying to him that um, I, w I wasn't too sure on cockroaches. Well, that was a mistake because I had 20 hissing cockroaches in my room the next day that I then had to care for. <laughs> so um, I love them now. They're great. And I, I you know, I, yeah, I lo absolutely love them. But I, um, it was a way to kind of get over them was to show me them and expose me to them. And he put jam, a jam on my nose once to attract the wasps to come and sit on my nose and eat. So it's, every day was different. There's lots of different stories like that. And I could honestly go on all night. But um, yeah, he's, he's an amazing person. And I'm eternally grateful to him, that's for sure. Oh, thank you so much, Megan. It was so nice to hear your memories and um, hear all your wonderful stories. Um, everyone has had a fantastic evening. We've had some lovely comments in the chat to say how wonderful it's been and how interesting and engaging. So thank you so much. And I also want to take the opportunity to thank all of our guests and our participants. Thank you for your kind donations. We are absolutely blown away by your generosity to be here this evening. As a charity, your support really does make a difference from protecting wildlife to helping people connect with nature and each other and every penny really helps, so thank you. And so we will draw to a close now. So a massive thank you again to Megan and for joining us at Sheffield and Rotherham remotely. Um, Liz, I don't know if you wanted to say uh, farewell. Yeah, ju just blown away, Megan. Just absolutely brilliant. I'm sure I speak for uh, everyone that's, um, you know, stayed on the call with us this evening. We've had over 180 people at times listening in. So, you know, you've really inspired people. And I, I think I've been looking at the chat, you know, there's so many young people are, who've been on the call as well. who have just like really been... Um, bowled over by what you've been saying and I was watching some of the expressions which you might not have been able to see but some people the picture of the fox in the snow I think you know just the eyes that that kind of somebody's somebody's face was just amazing when they saw that picture so um yeah you, you've just uh, um, reinforced all our passions for wildlife I'm sure and uh, I hope everyone feels really inspired now to just go out and do that that little action for nature be it you call yourself an activist or be it you call yourself uh, just um, a wildlife supporter it doesn't matter so um, thank you everyone for for joining us with Megan and uh, it's just been a wonderful evening so thank you so much Megan. Not at all thank you very much for having me and um, thank you for tuning in and um, Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.